I was at a function the other day and somebody asked me what I did. And I said, well, I, 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 I sort of specialize in communication skills. And they went, oh, is that telecommunications? I went, no, 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 no. I, I sort of had to dip more carrots into the hummus. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and I went, no. And they went, all oh, right. And then, then then they said, oh, I've got, I could connect you to somebody um, because they're in communication. I said, oh, that's nice. And um, and then and then she said to me, well, you know, they, they're a company who've produced this great communication tool. And wait for this, Michael. It's to um, help. It, it actually alerts you if you have an urgent email over the other emails and then it sends it to the I started to glaze over I mean I was I, I was starting to be very polite I went oh right that's not quite the communication I was thinking of but but you know I I, I, I take the option oh goodness me oh goodness me indeed Mitty just in that little short story sums up for me exactly what is wrong with our perception of the communications overwhelm through digital that is going on with us. And Mitty is on this amazing mission to create more human-centered communications in organizations around the globe. Now, it's no mean feat. It is not an easy task that she's doing out there because we are so conditioned with our smartphones, with our email machines, that we, we have forgotten how to create human-centered conversations. This is such a wonderful interview. Listen to Mitty's story from her beginnings how she discovered the world and traveled the world to learn about people, to learn about communications, how she trained herself to be absolutely perfect for the mission that she is now carrying out. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Mitty. How are you today? I'm very well, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And in our preamble before we started recording, I know there's going to be just amazing information you're going to share with the listeners, but also the, the topic that you talk about is very, very interesting to me and the work that I do. So I've got Lots of things that I'm sure will come up, but we'll get started with the very first question that I ask all my guests, and that is, tell us a little bit about your personal life. So where were you born? A bit about your education, uh, where you now live? Have you moved around in the world? Um, and I'm sure you have. And then, and then we'll transition into your first job and, and, and stuff like that after education. So... Over to you, Mitty. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm looking forward to um, chatting um, uh, and, and hope that um, the listeners will get lots of insights um, and uh, a sense of fun as well and, uh, and hopefully a sense of inspiration for themselves. Brilliant. So I started um, the beginning, so to speak. I was born in Ghana. And for listeners who are not aware of where that is, it's West Africa. Yeah. Um, and so I was born in Ghana um, and I was one of the first generation not to be born under colonialism in effect it was post-colonialism right and so uh, my parents generation had lived through colonialism but actually independence had left a very amicable relationship with the british and so my parents had lots and lots of nice english friends yes. um, many of them who didn't leave ghana um, and my own uncle is married to an english lady and so my auntie is now in her 80s and speaks better chi which is my mother tongue, than I do. <laughs> so wow. I grew up in a very international uh, cultural context. And as a child, I was simply 
um, able to mix uh, my traditional dance in my own country, which is called Adua, and high life, completely with soul music, classical music and Radio 4. Oh, I mean, they my were, word. They were all part of me. Um, and um, that was who I am. It was perfectly congruent and utterly aligned. Mm. And um, in later life, you know, when I came to live in England, I used to find it extraordinarily strange that... Um, people were pigeonholed, including me. There was a sort of stereotype and it just never sat with me because I was always part of two cultures. You yes. Know. yes. Um, yeah. So as a young adult, I suppose um, I was aware of and, and embraced different accents, different cultures, different way of life. And so I grew up partly in Ghana till I was 11. And then lots of nice English friends of my parents said, um, you know, why don't you educate them in England? And my parents' generation had put a lot of store on English education. Mm. Um, and so education in Ghana was extraordinarily brilliant. Yeah. Um, and uh, my my parents sacrificed an awful lot. And my father used to get the 11 plus from England, the exam papers, and used to make us all do it. There are four of us when we were 10 and a half. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that level of discipline was literally instilled with us, mm -hmm. in, in us. And um, anyway, uh, I'll cut a long story short, um, I was... Um, I, I managed to get a place um, at a school in Biddeford in Devon, which was a nice Methodist school because my mother was a Methodist. Right. Um, southwest of England. And um, it was a grammar school, which then turned into a, a, a fee paying school. And I, I went to school in Devon, right down the countryside. <laughs> Here comes the accents. Uh, absolutely. Right down the countryside with a nice bit of crumble, a nice bit of... <laughs> Nice bit of potato. So, so I have a whole set of family, friends, and and you know, childhood in North Devon. Oh, uh, Devon's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's yes. absolutely beautiful, England. Yes. Um, and then I went to university at Kent in Canterbury, um, and I grew up literally between Africa in Ghana, mm. Kenya, where I also grew up, and Scandinavia and England. Oh my word. <laughs> Well, how did you split your time between all these countries then? Well, um, in holidays, um, right. um, in holidays, I would go back and every year I would go back. I also need to say that my mother, who was a towering figure um, and a great influence in my family, mm. was insist that we um, obviously we spoke English at school. That was normal in Ghana. Yes. Um, but we absolutely had to speak our own mother tongue at home. And so um, that was um, really helpful in terms of being able to just pick up languages because our language tree um, is quite difficult. Um, but of course, I grew up with it and we had to speak tree. So I now speak tree um, fluently without an accent. You'd never know that I lived in England. Right. And I speak English fluently without an accent. And often people are astonished that I come from Ghana. <laughs> Uh, you're a hundred percent right. And how do, how do you spell that? That you say chi like C H I or how uh, chi? Um, so it's T W I, right? And and it's a very um, it's it. You have to purse your lips and go ch ch chi chi chi. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And it's and its other name is a shanty. If you look up Google, the Ashanti people speak ch. Tree, tree. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a group wow. of people. <laughs> that's a first for me. I didn't even know what the language was in Ghana, but that's brilliant. Yes, no, there are several languages, um, mm. but tree is one of the big ones because a whole raft of people speak it. So, for example, um, it would be like speaking English, but um, a group of people speaking with the Yorkshire accent, some speaking it with, with a Devonian accent, and some people speaking it with standard English. Um, yes. So tree mixes up a bit in terms of the Akan languages. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> And, and because you've moved around so, so much and, and, and travelled to different countries, I suppose the two main ones being Ghana and England, which one would you declare as kind of this is home? Gosh, that is an extraordinarily 
um, challenging question in the best possible yes, way. Yes, yes. Um, so if you push me, um, probably 10 years ago, I would have said uh, Ghana is my country in which my soul is, yes. but London is my home. Yes. Um, but now... I would say both of them are equal. Um, mm. And so I have my own mother um, who is still alive, which is wonderful, is going to be 90 next year. Brilliant. <laughs> so oh. it's so lovely to, I've just come back in March, you know, sitting on the veranda or the balcony, as you would say it here, yes. um, reminiscing. And um, it's it feels that it's in my soul. But when I get on the plane and I'm coming back and it says, and, you know, and Captain Smythe says, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to London Heathrow. I yes. think, oh, yes, I'm home as well. I'm home as <laughs> yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it obviously because your mum's still alive. And yes. wow, what a fantastic age. Then, of course, that has to still be home. Absolutely. There's Absolutely. no doubt about it. I, I'm, I have the same thing because I'm originally from the Netherlands, although I've lived in the UK, I've lived outside of the Netherlands for over 40 years. It's still, you know, there's, I, I love the Netherlands more than I did when I lived there, probably. Yes, yes, um, yes. And it's, yeah, it's a difficult one. And I've still got my, I still have my Dutch passport. And <laughs> I didn't yeah. relinquish that. So I, I know how you feel. I know yes. how you feel. Yes. Uh, and and uh, like you, I am a dual national. Um, about 15 years ago, I just made sure that I got all that sorted out because mm. I, I have I have a leg and a soul in both camps, in both continents. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, what you said you went to, to Canterbury to university – and what did you study there? I did politics and international relations. Wow. And it was it was great fun. Um, mm. I loved it. Um, and I could easily have had a career in international affairs. In fact, we'll come back to that later. Mm. I had a sort of secondary, um, equally strong career in international affairs um, um, to satisfy that. But that's what I did. Um, and then I came to London where I won a scholarship um, to City University, um, where I did a postgraduate in journalism. And was that the plan? Did you have a clear plan of where you wanted to go? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my, my plan was... Um, it was instilled in us at home that you would you would certainly work hard enough to go to university. Yes. <laughs> so politics and international relations was perfect for me. Um, but why, um, why was it perfect? Well, I suppose that um, a like most people, I'd actually done rather well, um, surprisingly well in my politics A level. <laughs> right. Um, and international relations was very much part of the sort of, I suppose, the landscape of me yes. that I would describe as international. Yes. So international relations, international affairs, international the person, international the business, international, you mm. know, bring mm. it on. Yeah. And they this combined um, uh, degree. And I thought, well, I'll have a bit of that. I'll try that. Yeah. You were very lucky, I think. Or really smart to pick that, I think, because that's a that's a wonderful because, as you said, it was who you were and there was a, a, a course, a degree that fitted you like a glove. Yes. And I, I think I was um, by almost instinct fortunate to pick it. Um, yeah. I, I also came from a family where um, I think my parents were... Um, they put great store on education, but didn't force us down a particular narrow, you know, I wasn't forced to do law, <laughs> right, you know, right. or, or, you know, or all the other subjects that perhaps, you know, or I did, I wasn't told to be a doctor, so to speak. Yes. Um, what I knew I loved was reading books. You know, I could read forever. A lot of friends from Devon, um, who I'm still very good friends with, would say, oh, we always used to remember Mitty, um, you know, sitting in the corridor reading a book. Mm. <laughs> so international mm. relations was just perfect for me. And I just um, embraced it. I loved it. Mm. Brilliant. So then the scholarship into journalism. Yeah. And is there a particular, is that a general course on journalism or was it something specific? 
Oh, no, it was very, very specific. And I was very lucky because um, I couldn't afford to go. Um, and um, I applied for a scholarship. It was a bursary in those days. Yes. Um, and so I was one of a handful of people who got the bursary. At the time, actually, there was another equally great course and, and there are the two big universities that do journalism um city in um, city university in london and cardiff university and i was incredibly fortunate to get a place at both in fact i was on my way to cardiff i'd planned to go to cardiff thinking right. i've never been to cardiff when i got this extraordinary letter to say i'd won the bursary to go to city as well so i thought yes i'll stay oh, in london wow. it was wonderful. but it was very specific um and there were two uh, parts to it. There was, um, you could do uh, written journalism or you could do radio journalism, of which, you know, bits of both were included. Um, and um, that whole class did extraordinarily well. I mean, there are some very famous faces um, on national and international television who um, were from my 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 class my, my wow. group yeah yeah totally you know it, it, i mean some very very talented people from magazines like vogue right through to sky news a lot of people um i see on television now were part of city university's postgraduate course in journalism Fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very hard, very hard work, um, yes. an absolute eye opener. And the training is brilliant. I yes. mean, I, I remember, um, you know, one of the first things I had to do was to cover a flower show um, and go to the town hall um, yeah. at the local authority and come back with a story. Um, and also in my day, um, we were taught T-line shorthand, um, which was a form of speed writing. I'm not sure whether they do it now. And it was brilliant because it really focuses your mind. Yes. It means you can hear and listen to stories, listen to people and jot it down very quickly and be incredibly accurate in your reporting. Mm. Mm. Wow. And how long was that course for? Oh, that was for a year. Um right was for a year um, and of course it was brilliant because um, we parts of you know so we developed in a, in a sense from a flower show story at the beginning and by the end um, very very privileged to go and spend a day in Downing Street at number 10 um, and, um, and so I'm showing my age in those days I remember we had um, we were invited um, to spend the day with the uh, He's now Sir Bernard Ingham, um, who, of course, was the private secretary, very famous private secretary to Mrs. Thatcher. And so it was it was absolutely. And I've got my wonderful picture of, of the group of, of the City University students outside number 10 Dining Street with our <laughs> with our teacher on my wall in my house, in my living room. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Wow. Well done. And then after all that, um, so that year doing that course, what, what happened next? Where did you go and get a job? Yes, I did. I mean, I had to knuckle down, really. Yes. So um, I I applied for a gazillion jobs. Um, and of course, um, in fact, the late 80s was starting yet another recession. Um, and um, very few people were hiring a young, um, non-experienced African British young woman who wanted mm. to be a journalist. Um, and so I eventually started through contacts to do shifts um, at BBC Broadcasting House on the late night shifts for free. Right. Um, and that um, got me a job at BBC Radio Brighton. I became a radio journalist and then I came back to London and started freelancing um, for the BBC. Right. Um, and then eventually got a job at um, ITV and became a television journalist. Um, uh, what was then Television South, which was then part of ITV, and I did everything. I owed my entire career to a wonderful man called Andy Forrester. Um, and you may know um, Greg Dyke. Um, he used yes. to be my ultimate boss. And there I learned to write television scripts. I worked on every kind of program, the time, the place, the equivalent of world in action. I worked 
worked. Um, I, I worked as a live a live reporter. I was a presenter, um, and then I was a producer director. Went to London Weekend Television, um, and then eventually left television part one, and became head of public relations at the University of Surrey in Guildford, where I helped revolutionise how public relations was done in universities. <laughs> what well, that sounds incredible. Yeah. <laughs> It was an it was an action packed decade. Oh my god! <laughs> so uh, when you how what that that what did that involve? Kind of redoing that course or whatever you were doing at that university. Yeah. So um, basically, I have to say and just throw it in for my poor old for the listeners who probably think, "Gosh, this woman's completely mad." <laughs> I do. I do look back and I think, "How did I fit that all in?" But I yes. ought to say that um, when I left the BBC, I left the BBC doing shifts because I actually got my first ever grand job as a parliamentary researcher in the House of Commons right. and I worked for an all party committee um, with um, uh, Lord Carrington who put, sadly passed away last year and the absolutely wonderful now Sir Alf Dubbs um, who is still in, par in, in the House of Lords um, and um, it was over the Cyprus question. So I really learned, this was my international relations part coming yes, back. You know? Yes. And, and my job as a, a parliamentary researcher from all party committee was to organise the first ever um, big conference between Greek and Turkish Cypriots in terms of its, its national parliaments to come together to try and sort out what was called the green line and, 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 and some of the issues that were there. And it was absolutely brilliant training. So I organised a massive conference which was held in London. Um, and so that was the first job. And then obviously when that finished, I went to um, the University of Surrey and became head of public relations. What that looked like was fabulous. Um, it had a national um, it wanted to raise its profile nationally, and it was also incredibly well known um, amongst academic circles for um, part a satellite. It, it literally was trying to build satellites, and it has an excellent psychology department, yeah. um, but nobody really knew about it. Mm. <laughs> so... Um, I, you know, I had a lot of energy then. Um, and I remember thinking, gosh, that's extraordinary. We need to get out there. And so I organised, I started to write a booklet called um, um, Get in Touch, um, Getting in Touch for Journalists or whatever. And we literally, I literally said to the leadership, we've got to get you in there um, so that, you know, if there is a breaking story, we want to be the first at the University of Surrey to be called. We don't mm. want London University to be called. We want the University of Surrey to be called. Yes. Um, and so it was a whole new era for them. Um, and I remember one of the professors saying, oh, don't you think this is all a bit fast? It'll never work. And I remember saying, gentlemen, public relations is a bit like trying to catch the bus. Uh, in, in essence, there is a bus stop and a bus timetable. And you either want to be there to catch the bus or else you miss the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And we we don't want to miss the bus. So, yes. so we need to do this. Anyway, um, the greatest highlight uh, and our proudest moment was when um, – um, university um, students and the university students started wanted there was the first wave of 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 literally protests because of the first wave of student loans, the idea of student loans coming in. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to, in, to in, interview, um, the BBC Newsnight wanted to interview a vice chancellor of a university. And um, moi here was on that phone and I went, our oh, vice chancellor is absolutely the person that you need to interview yes. in Guildford. And we beat them to it. They didn't ask a London university. It was my vice chancellor who was on Newsnight on BBC Two being interviewed about this very topical subject. That was absolutely a highlight. Um, and the other big highlight was at the time, you know, I used to just basically build relationships at the, the university departments and discovered that we had this extraordinary nine-year-old who was literally being 
he was getting a degree at the university because he was such a brilliant scientist. He was one of those geniuses. Oh, my word. It was unbelievable. A wonderful Sri Lankan British boy. Well, I discovered him, went to see his parents, got permission from the vice chancellor um, and then rang the media, sold it in. And we were on every single front page of a national newspaper. Wow. And, you know, we were talking pre-social media, so it was quite a coup. Yeah. Um, and that's the sort of thing we energised the University of Surrey. It was such fun. And and what year was that in um, that you were in? Have, I, was, I was at Surrey from 1990 to 1992. Right, right. Yeah. And the other thing we did, uh, because of the satellite stuff, I um, was asked to uh, front a massive project between the university and um, the European Space Agency, which was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and I think it's now got a very, very prestigious science park at the University of Surrey. So I have very close ties in my heart with the University of Surrey. Well, you did a lot for them, didn't you? My <laughs> word. Yes, great fun. I hope they're grateful for what you... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I still have contacts there, but I think life has changed so much. But it yes. was a built foundations, you know, solid stuff, you yes. know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. So that was University of Surrey in Guildford. And I used to live not very far away from Guildford, actually. I used to live in Farnham, just down the road from Guildford. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. I remember Farnham very well. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Great fun. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. part my of it. Brother, my brother still lives there. So, right then. So, what happened after after that? Did did you continue in public relations or do something different? Well, you'll be, um, and this is as as part of my character. Um, very sadly for me, um, um, at that time, my my beloved father passed away, and after I came back from Ghana. Um, I sat in my office and I remember thinking one afternoon, mm, it's just, you know, it's very strange that he's gone, but um, mm. life is very short because it was the first very close death to me, you know, yes. and it was just a shock. And I remember thinking, oh, well, I, I want to do something different. I want to do something that I haven't, I haven't experienced. I don't want life to pass me by. And I thought I'd been brought up in Africa and in, in Europe and in England. I wonder what else is out there. I'd love to see Asia and, and, and Australia. Of course. So, of course, <laughs> as you do on an afternoon at work yeah. in your lunch break. And so, before I knew it, I went out for lunch, went to a travel agency. Um, and when I came back, I had bought a round the world ticket. Oh. And because I I was in a senior position, so I needed to give six months notice. Um, I thought, well, I'll plan this. I bought the ticket now. I'm going around the world. Um, and so I remember some very kind professors. Half or half the establishment went, oh, that's amazing, Mitty, go for it. And the other, in, in wonderful British style, went, well, you know, are you sure? Mm. I mean, you're is just taking off now you mm. know and i remember another friend saying well what will you do about your pension i thought well what about it yes <laughs> so so i did and i i i said to um my sister at the time i've got some news and i think she rolled her eyes you know she knew me uh, and i said could i use your attic i'm going around the world in six months so i sold my car i sold my house and um oh. uh, a very, very close friend of mine who was a lecturer who has remained great friends with me to this day over 25 years. She's now a professor. Right. Um, she literally waved me goodbye at Heathrow Airport with a rack sack on my back, hugged me as I took Aeroflot to start my trip around the world. Oh, my word. That's where my absolute... I suppose, love affair with different cultures and different people really then cemented completely built on my childhood yes. because I literally went all across Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, you name it. I went to every single state in Australia. I lived in New Zealand and then I was in the United States of America for six months, literally from Hawaii right through to Alaska. Wow. 
and and okay so this is going to be a difficult one which was <laughs> your favorite country you visited i knew you were gonna say that <laughs> oh that's unfair michael <laughs> uh, first of all what i would say um is that that level of travel is an education that i believe no classroom or book can give you correct um it, it's astonishing and and you have to have done it almost to experience it it's in my soul even after all this time that's right in terms of uh countries the world is actually a very beautiful place despite all this angst that we hear in the media yes. and for me, as a journalist um and once a journalist always a journalist i remember i was struck by that contraindication when i got off the plane for example um in sri lanka and you know we were on a bus going through the countryside i remember thinking this is why i've traveled mm. you know this is astonishing and I learned too that most people, most ordinary people, want the same things in life right across the globe. Yes. They want peace, they want prosperity, they want a better life for their children, and they want joy, they want to smile. Yes. And I experienced it for 12 months, you know, across literally country after country. Mm. Um and so I am very very much influenced by that i would say that the two countries and i love all the places i went but as i have to be and it, for me it's very sad with what's recently happened but you know um Sri Lanka is a beautiful country yeah absolutely stunning to look at yeah. uh, and the other great place i remember i i thought that uh, i mean it sounds stupid but i thought that i I'd hop into Perth in Australia and be able to meet a friend that same day who lived in Melbourne. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was young and naive. Um, and I think Australia is very beautiful. I remember uh, flying into Queensland and just being astonished by the level of greenery in contrast to the Northern Territory, which was part desert, you yes. know. Um, and then, you know, New Zealand isn't called the land of the white clouds for nothing. It's absolutely astoundingly beautiful. Mm, yes. Beautiful. Yes. Especially the South Island. It's extraordinarily beautiful. You're aghast by how beautiful it is. I and I hundred percent concur, and I was hoping you would say New Zealand, because <laughs> that's my most favourite country on earth, no question. I, I, I regrettably I was only there for ten days, and when you just said you lived there for a while, I went, oh my god. Yeah. Um, but it's just, and I and I travel both on the South and North Island, mm -hmm. and I was only there for ten days, and and travelled like thousands of miles. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's just a beautiful, breathtaking country. Yeah, and and it's uh, and going back to the sort of upbringing and and childhood and cross culture. Interestingly, at university at Kent, I had a great girlfriend who is a great girlfriend to this day, mm -hmm. and she ended up marrying a Kiwi, wow. and so by the time I travelled around the world and got to New Zealand, she was happily settled and her her husband's family owned one of the only macadamia nut farms in the South Island. Wow. They make macadamia and ice cream. I went, I went round the world. When I left, I was rather thin. When I came back, I remember getting off the plane and a friend saying, mm, you look rather well. <laughs> <laughs> Decode English for fat. Put on weight, Mitty. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yes. So I'm afraid it was lots of lettuce leaves after I came back for a yes, while. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And then did you come back with a bump then or? I came back with a bump thinking that everybody had obviously naturally experienced the high and the joy and the cultural connections that I had made. Yes from traveling and it's a terrible shock to realize that actually nobody really understands because nobody else has just been around the world that's right so that was a real education in itself um and um it was very hard to get a job um um but then i did start doing some voluntary work um mm. for a chat 
city and I helped organize on the side a massive conference called um, Tomorrow's Africa. <laughs> so it's sort of cross backing. And again, it had lots of um, international people involved because of my international relations experience. Mm -hmm. and, and I was an events organizer for that. And that really bridged the gap. Um, and then after that, I believe it or not, I trained as a recruitment consultant. <laughs> Uh, uh, because of course you do and so um and i i worked for reed yes and used to have to go to reed university to train so i'm i'm really quite a good executive search even though i say it myself okay. and i did that for two years and then um applied for jobs um and then one day through friends and friends and applications, I got, um, this was now 1999, I got a job um, for Network Rail, um, which was then called Rail Track, and they wanted a communications person. And I got interviewed along with any, everybody. And the, um, the sponsor um, said, you've got the job. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> anyway, it was a one year piece of work. And it was Y2K. Do you remember Y2K yes, when yes. it was going to doom? Um, you know, all the clocks were going to work and the computers were going to go belly up yes, and all the rest of it. That's right. And so every company was paranoid that their systems were, you know, were going to have to be fit for purpose. Um, and my job was to make sure that all the various parts of the humongous project, IT project, um, was was basically gelling in terms of people. Yes. Now, I at the time, I didn't realize what I was doing, but because uh, I thought it was common sense, it was innate. But, you know, I was working incredibly long hours. I was learning a lot about IT systems, mergers, um, how project managers speak versus uh, PMOs, that's program management or office uh, versus business analysts. I, I, I learned to understand all that language. I was also happened to sit next to um, E and Y consultants, Ernst and Young consultants, and I literally learned massive management consultancy um, disciplines and frameworks but I was putting my own my own MITI uh, um, style on it because for me central to all that was that I got up and spoke to people mm. and and the, the the Y2K project was such a success based on my ability to join up all the invisible dots two people both a sponsor and this great great friend of mine who was then at e and y said to me you need to bottle this up you, you you can we've never seen a project be this successful and i thought wow. really I, I just had no idea what i was doing mm. michael mm. it was so instinctive yeah. just pick up connect you know write reports in a way that people understood go and charm where difficult conversations had to be had um, build those relationships understand how people ticked join people who would otherwise not speak to each other together who's nevertheless needed to understand each other and i was doing it completely innately on instinct well you say that but you had some training as well because there was your upbringing, number yeah. one, there yeah. was your international travel, there was your world travel, yeah. there was your public relations skills. You had studied, you know, journalism, communication. Yes. You then um, managed to do recruitment. So you had an insight into people as well yeah. and what makes them tick. Yes. Uh, and, and you know, communicate with them. So you did, the instinct was yes. actually your conditioning along the journey. You're absolutely right. I, I think you've highlighted, you're absolutely right. On reflection, that's exactly what it was. Mm. Uh, the foundations and the training and the experience to date was so strong yes. that it was it was driving how I did what I did. And yeah. therefore you did it automatically, but you'd, yeah. you'd, you'd had all the training to be yes. able to do it automatically. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Amazing, though. Just yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And that then led me to what became almost a two-decade career in what was then to be known as change management communication. Yes. <laughs> Which was, you know, if companies are changing, uh, the world's changing with them, around them, on behalf of them, um, systems are changing, there are merger and acquisitions, really quite complex stuff. Yes. Um, there were specialists like me who would be hired to go in there to create a people solution to that. Something that, you know, at times HR might do, but actually they don't always have uh, necessarily the specialist skills or the capacity all the time. And these are big projects. They're looking after companies and this would be a particular project within a company or a program within a company. And so I kept being recommended on um, and um, did that for, for two years. You know, clients included some of the big banks, you know. Um, so, for example, a, a merger between what was clerical medical Halifax Halifax becoming part of Bank of Scotland, Bank of Scotland then being taken over by Lloyd's was one that I would have worked, I worked on. Right. Huge. Yeah, very complex. Yeah. Wow. So more training. <laughs> <laughs> more training with lots of banks with different cultures. Can you yes. imagine? Oh, you know, my clerical, word. clerical medical had been around since 1824 or something. Mm. Halifax has been around for a long time. Bank of Scotland was a pedigree bank in its own right. And Lloyd's was also a huge. And, and you're bringing all those together with different cultures within those different people and different ways of life. So it was a mixture of culture, communication, the change management. Um, it was a great ride. For It was great fun. And that really then what led me to where I am now um, because what happened um, was that as the years went by I noticed that with the advance of technology and process yes the programs the outputs and the outcomes were becoming incredibly and almost unnecessarily complicated in order to get the same result yes because what would happen at the beginning when I first started was people were at the heart of it. I mean, you went and, and they just say to you, make it happen. We want people to have some decent relationships. And that's what I saw. But but then as as the advent of processes came, because as, as companies merged and became bigger, of course, you need to have processes. But then it was becoming more process driven. So it was process then people. And then, of course, in the sort of last decade and, and you know, with the advent of smartphones and technology, heavens above, um, the whole what I call the three Ps, people, process and technology in the, of that order completely flipped. So in lots of businesses now, it, it's almost a default that the technology is the panacea to everything. And of course it isn't. It's very helpful, but it's supposed to be an enabler. So as as our, we were make, doing these, it was just getting harder and harder um, for, for staff who just, just were glazing over with the amount of sort of push-pull technology um, that management were pouring on them. So it was becoming technology process people. And yes. you're not going to get the best out of your people when they feel that actually they are secondary or actually not a priority at all in most cases. Mm. I've, I've lived through that uh, as well. When I used, to, I worked in the textile industry for a long while in the UK and company mergers and then the solution was to merge the company was let's put technology over the top of it yeah. before even the merger had properly been completed. Yeah. Um, and what you say about people and processes and technology, they, they took the processes um, and rather than re-engineer the process, they just put them into technology and of course it failed. Yes. And the millions and the millions that has been spent and wasted in failed yes. IT projects. Yes. Phenomenal. Yes. Phenomenal. Yes. It is, it is. And, and I remember when staff would try to say in one particular uh, company I was in, um, you know, this process isn't working, you know, on an end to end life cycle project. You know, you'd have management going, we're tired of hearing that it's the process. Make it work. Make mm. the process work. Mm. And, and, and you could literally feel the 
the, 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 the staff just disconnecting and disengaging because yeah. nobody was hearing them. And they just thought, you know, right, whatever. And that's when you start to lose the heart of your business because yeah. you're nothing without people. And and in case anybody thinks that this is a bit fluffy, um, last year in 2018, um, the Serial Switch survey came out and said the United Kingdom lost 7.1 billion in business due to poor communication with its customers. Mm. 7.1 billion this country lost. So it's, and and the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, thankfully for me to back up what I'm saying, yes. um, brought up a survey uh, last year, uh, at the end of last year, and um, it was a global survey with um, the United Kingdom, America, the Middle East, Africa, and 88% of respondents said their biggest problem in the workplace, in the modern workplace now, is poor communication. You know, I think there is this complete obsession with technology and digital transformation. And don't get me wrong, it's all very important and all the rest of it. <laughs> yes. But not at the expense of the people. No. Because at the end, the people who, the, the thing that's going to make you your profit are your employees and your customers. Yes. And it's not enough to sheep dip your employees into a bit of internal comms and a bit of external comms and a bit of this type of comms and silo it. What you've got to do is join the invisible dots, get everybody to have communication skills in the muscle with joy from the heart. So they want to be in their business, that they can have meaningful relationships to overcome some of the difficulties in the modern workplace, mm. driven often sometimes by process and technology. If you can't have that missing piece and that sweet spot, you know, one of the biggest problems for organizations now is that even if they can find the talent, and we know at the current time, you know, talent is pretty fiercely comp competitive. If you can find the right talent, a lot of them are saying they can't retain the talent. A lot of them leave. Yeah. And yeah. they leave because they are unhappy. Yeah, and course. they are unhappy because they've got a grim emotional experience in the workplace. They're too stressed out. They yeah. can't do it anymore. And so it really is a problem. Um, and I think when 88 percent of, of a workforce says that poor communication in the modern workplace is one of the key issues, I think it needs to be taken very seriously. And and, you know, we I think we don't keep we don't need any more data to tell us that there is a problem. It's lovely to have it. We need to action it now. And that's why I, I, I started creating the programs from all these years of experience. Yes. Um, and my innovative communication programs are basically that. So for me, innovative communication um, sets us apart because what that is, is communication skills that enable you to inspire others to lead change, uh, to develop consensus and shared understanding, and to maintain and create connective relationships. And as a result of all that, drive business performance, productivity, and your bottom line profit. Mm. And, and it's the invisible glue that joins all those bits up. And the other thing from my years of experience that we've done is that we have created those programs so that we've got one for leadership, as in EXCO, executive committees and management level. Yes. We've got one for managers, which I, you know, who are the poor frozen middle, who are just getting it upstairs, downstairs, sideways, mm. and it just completely overwhelmed. And we've created another bespoke program for what I call next generation leaders and frontline staff. And then those programs literally get them to understand each other get the skills in the muscle that joins each other up so that it is not siloed. It is not done by a function, which is just a bit of internal comms and a bit of external comms. It means every single person who does our program goes out thinking, wow, I've got that in the chest. I understand this. I really have got this in the muscle and I have a part to play. It's 
as being a part of the business solution with my new dynamic communication skills and I can have the right conversations because I now know how it fits into the rather massive, complex jigsaw puzzle. And at the centre of it is, is trust. It, it's trust. Because if you haven't got any relationships where trust is, you can't overcome the difficulties. You know, I recently had a conversation. Um, it was quite a difficult conversation, well, challenging conversation. And we uh, had, a dis you know, we disagreed on particular things. But actually, we came to a wonderful outcome because it wasn't... Um, I had nothing against the person and they didn't have anything against me. It was an open, honest conversation where we were both hearing each other and we came to a fair compromise. Mm. That's how that's how you drive business. Um, otherwise, your people are walking into the door. They're glazed over, aren't they? Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that's... The I mean, it's a great segue into this whole topic now. Uh, you've kind of opened, taken the lid off. And so this is this is fundamental, obviously, because you can see it, you know it, the statistics are there, the data is there. So the question is, why do you think people struggle so much in doing something about it? Well... I think there are, there are two or three reasons. One, there is somehow an assumption by everybody, individual, business and society, that everybody's got communication skills because they get up in the morning and they speak to you. <laughs> so, so, so in business where there've been, you know, with the recession um, and I think the, um, the financial crisis of 2008, when budgets were cut, um, austerity uh, didn't just uh, impact the whole country, as you know, it impacted businesses. And basically, I think with all those training budgets cut, there was the assumption somehow that communication skills needed to drive business performance would somehow just happen on its own right. right. So in fairness uh, to employees um, and anybody associated with driving business from a communications perspective, um, there's not a lot of training around that works. There is a lot of sheep dipping sometimes, yes. but there's not a lot of real under the you know belly muscle, get in the muscle there. So that's one thing I think cuts. Um, the other thing is the complete overtaking of technology at the expense of people mm. more and more and more you know through this magic of global technology you know we are connected online more than ever um, but actually it's also giving us a whole bunch of other issues that we're not tackling very well, yeah. which is that we're connected more and more to e um, online, but actually not really to each other. <laughs> you know, if you think of the number of, of ways in which we communicate, the majority of it is now online. Um, yes. And rather than picking up the phone and hearing somebody's voice like you and I are doing now yes. um, or actually seeing somebody, you know, you've got people. I, and I, I was astonished. I have a couple of friends who who said that actually they, they had to admit that, you know, they they actually contact that a member of their own family in their own house via a smartphone, I'm afraid, mm -hmm. you know, that that's a worry in the same house. So so I think that the advent of smartphones, technology and, and, and the plethora of technology at our disposal, while brilliant in so many ways, has created a whole raft of new problems that we've got to get a grip on so that we can get that balance between people and technology right um and and so that's what led me to i suppose develop my brochure take it offline how to break your online habit and why you should yes. um because we wrote it so that you've got lots of top tips um um, from an individual's point of view, from a business point of view, and from a society's point of view, because all three parts are part of an ecosystem so that people are not driven to mental health illness because it's becoming a problem. It is a problem. It's a massive problem. And the difficulty, I mean, I admire you for having a go at it because the problem is so 
huge. It's huge. It's humongous. If you and look, if you look at people walking down the street, you know, mm. I can't tell you the number of times that I, 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 I thought, let me just stand still, and this person is going to walk straight into me because yeah. they are literally walking down the street and totally absorbed by their smartphone. Completely, completely. School children in the morning when I walk the dog, school children, I'm talking seven-year-olds have got the latest, latest mm -hmm. Apple thousand pound phones in their hands. They've got ear pods in and they're walking. I saw one young girl, she was holding the phone to, to her chest, to her heart, like holding it like a precious little, like a prize, like something really precious that she didn't yes. want to lose. You know, yes. they, they hold on to these things because their life they are living in there, you know. Yes, it, literally. And it's not just living. Um, it's an addiction. Mm. And and it's become, I think, a real problem because it's an addiction. And, and no addiction is good for anybody, you, you know. Um, so if I quote you some, some data and statistics, Please. just yes. so that, I mean, 62% of all adults rising to 78% amongst those aged 25 to 34 said that they could not live without their mobile phone. So that backs up what you said. Yeah. And... It's incredible. It's incredible. Now, we know, you know, we already know that it's not going to get easier for people because no. technology isn't going to stand still. They're creating things that we don't even know what's coming exactly. down the line exactly. that's going to make people more addicted. In fact, I wrote an article in 2013 and the, um, for a little publication called the Insignificant Journal of Psychology. And they asked me for an article and I wrote, the, the title of it is, Do Social Networks Sell Drugs? <laughs> Not as in, do they sell drugs to sell them on social media, which they obviously probably do, but more along the lines of creating that addiction to people. Mm -hmm. So... It was then that I could see the signs where this addiction was. And already people were going to psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, with their addiction issues. Have you come across um, the Centre for Humane Technology with Tristan Harris? No. I'd, yeah, it sounds interesting. No, I haven't. Well, hmm. I'll send you the link, but I'll, I'll include it perhaps in, in the notes as well. But Tristan Harris, um, he was a ex-Google ethicist, right? Mm. That mm. means he had to ensure that some of the things that Google were doing were mm. ethical. Mm. And he he's done a wonderful TED talk where when he, he exposed that they had engineers sitting in a room mm. and their prime purpose was to make people addicted to the internet. Oh, of course. I mean, that's what the apps do. Yes. You know, the apps are there. Um, uh, so that and they are they are built in such a way that people are addicted to apps. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. And it's interesting you should talk about this uh, gentleman, Tristan, because um, even Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was the founder of the World yes. Wide Web, yes. um, has set up a, a, an organisation um, called the World Wide Web Foundation. I don't know whether you know about it. And he has developed uh, what he is calling a new contract for the web. Mm. And he, he says it's time time for all of us to play our role to make sure the web and technology serves all of humanity rather than harms it. That's from the founder. That's from the person who created it. Brilliant. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And I think, you know, Michael, there is now a, a reverse process of work that needs to be done, which is where I feel so passionately about. Because there is going to be more technology, um, which is which is brilliant when it's brilliant, but has, has a lot of issues that come with it, it's time for us to acknowledge and recognise that and go back to learning how to get the balance right. Because people assume, they often say to me, well, you know, says somebody a bit old, that's the basics, but it's no longer the basics. That's the point. Mm. If it was the basics, people would automatically at work 
not be obsessed with, I mean, Forbes have said that people are now getting over 200 emails a day. It's taking them two and a half hours. So if there were some so-called basic automatic things that should be happening, people shouldn't be wading through 200 emails a day, should they? You should be, they should be doing that automatically uh, and, and finding mechanisms not to be able to do 200 emails a day, but they're not. So we are going to have to train, up train in a sense, because, you know, for example, top tips, if you want fewer emails and messages, start sending fewer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Stop copying everybody on the Don't email. Stop copying everybody in the email. And, you know, be bold. Don't be afraid to delete emails and messages you've been sent, but you don't need to reply to. But we had this issue 15 years ago. I remember when I was still in corporate life, I used to say to people, stop doing the CYA kind of email, <laughs> you know, yeah. with everybody in copy. Yeah. Only send it to the person who has to actually take action. Absolutely. But but there is this default, isn't there? There is this default. Uh, and, you know, for example, I'm always astonished that, you know, they're pouring gazillions into teaching our young people to code. You know, mm. well, we're teaching young people to code who can barely articulate, have got no confidence and depend on likes on their Facebook in order to feel whole. Yeah, I, I, I think we need to get the balance right. All great to code. Got nothing against coding. No. All I'm saying is let's split the budget and get a young person to feel fabulous about themselves, yes. have innate qualities which are human to them and to those around them so that they can articulate and build meaningful relationships so that they can do make the best of the coding that they learn. Yes, yes. You see? Oh, absolutely. So that actually they are more conscious when they're coding because they understand this product that I'm coding for is going to actually do the right thing in in business or wherever it's going to be Absolutely. used for the consumer rather than damage them. So if they have Absolutely. and if they've got those life skills or communication skills Absolutely. or understanding, then they're going to be able to do a better job. That's what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. I mean, again, let's just go back to some, some backup data. But again, in 2008, um, the American Pew Research Center, which is a, a group of leading uh, US academics, engineers and research scientists and writers, uh, wrote about the impact of digital technologies having on our well-being. And this is what they said. Um, they said that um, from their research, Online addiction is harming our focus, our memory, our creativity, our judgment, our critical thinking and our mental resilience. And we need that. We need those skills as human beings. Yes. It's who we are. Mm. We, we can't decry them. And the more we, we decry them and think they're not important and don't give them priority, I'm afraid the more societal problems that we will have. Yes. Um, because, you know, at the moment, the problem we've got is that trust in the world um, from a, a business level, an individual and a society is at an all time low. It's harming society, government and business. At worst, it's costing lives and it's costing money and money businesses can't afford to lose and people can't afford to be that unhappy. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And for me, you know, one of the things I would say is that the desire for change, you know, for what I call the four P's, people, purpose, profit, planet, is urgent and, and, and global and growing. And, and the foundations for the change that people are seeking will be built from communication skills that has humanity and integrity at its soul. And that's what our communication accelerator programs are about. That's how we define differentiate. That's why we're different. Um, it's a relationship-centered communication program. It's relational communications rather than what I call transactional. 
personal communications, yes. which is what a lot of companies use. Let me give you an example. Recently, a bank manager said to me, oh, Mitty, I wish you were with us. And it was a very large bank. And I said, why? He said, because I have just been issued this instruction that from now on, HR have just sent this to say that from now on, if we want to contact them, we've got to submit our question through a portal. Mm. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted, frustrated, and I'm, I'm a stressed out bank manager. I just want to talk to somebody. Yes. Yeah. Now, that's why that bank manager is likely to leave, isn't it? Yeah, eventually he will because he'll just get frustrated Precisely. with the Precisely. process or the system that he now has to follow. Precisely. And, and it is difficult these days to be able to speak to somebody. Yes. And everywhere and, now. And, and yet, and yet, it is certain, the, the more difficult it is to speak to somebody, the more we yearn to speak to somebody because we are made to speak to somebody. <laughs> Correct. Yes. So it becomes, we become more lonely, become more stressed out because we're not actually to actually connect with a human voice and with the energy of the human voice. Mm -hmm. Completely, completely. Um, and, 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 and so it goes on. And so for me, um, the fundamental thing now is that I want to help spearhead what I call a global movement, part of my international sort of heart, really, um, uh, both here in Britain, across the Middle East. Our whole purpose is to create a global movement of game-changing communicators who help drive change for the better and drive businesses for the greater good, because businesses have got to put this back at the heart of their agenda. And I'm afraid to say that because of presumably austerity, etc., lots and lots of businesses, particularly large ones, have lost their ability to do it. Yeah. And, and if they hadn't, we wouldn't have lost 7.1 billion in business profits last year. Yeah. And how then, what, what's the plan then to have people that are that you train up to be able to do that across the world or yes at the moment what i've done is global thinking boutique approach <laughs> yes yes um so it, it's it's quite personalized in terms of groups or we go into companies and you know i can do some consultancy but my great great ambition is to um, be able to to train others. I mean, we've got a very small team, but for us to train others in in our program so yes. that they can go and spread it uh, business wise individuals. The, the other thing we do, which also knits everything together, which I forgot to add, is that we train two groups who help bring the world together. We train native English speakers because we know both both you and I and all the listeners that just because we speak English as a native language doesn't mean that we're necessarily great communicators. No. So, so native speakers, but then there is another huge gap in the market, which is imperative um, given how global we've become. Mm. And that is people who have English as a second language, but are nevertheless in business expected to communicate as if English were their first. Yes. It's a huge gap in the market. And I know this because I spent four years having executives and employees from all over Europe um, and the America, South America, coming to live with me. Um, and to originally, they were coming to learn English, but then they would wait. Um, I was doing it through an agency and the agency kept saying to them, but we, we've got more English teachers. And they went, no, we want to only be with Mitty. And and I, I said to some of my very highly um, uh, uh, high profile clients, why have you waited all this time? And they were the ones who gave me the ka-ching moment. They said, because you're not just teaching us English. 
you are teaching us how to communicate. And we notice when we go back to our country, the way we approach our communication skills with the English language um, means that people are energized. And also it's aligning to the performance. They are getting better, which is great for our productivity. And I realized instinctively, Michael, I was teaching my book. Yes, yes. I was teaching my book. And, and, and for me, one of the issues I realized was that ordinary, we're not a language school because language schools are failing in this bit. There is a missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And, and so what I do now with part of this program is, is what I call we help people. And leadership is not just about senior management. Leadership is about managers being leaders, frontline staff, understanding how what role they play. And I have what I call the 343 principle. The structure is people, process, technology in that order in a modern workplace. We don't decry process and technology. It's an enabler. The focus is people, purpose, profit, planet. That's the framework in which our programs uh, operate. And that's the new world in which we need to operate in. And the gains from that structure and focus are performance, productivity and profit. That's our 343 principle. Love it, yeah. She's like, <laughs> I, yeah. and the, I'm I'm thinking about the practical side of mm. how you will, you know, scale this around mm. the globe, or even, mm. even in the EU, because you're yeah. kind of based here. Yeah. You know, in terms of scaling this project, mm. and how. So, if you were to do a call out, we're on this podcast now. Mm -hmm. What kind of people are you looking for? Are you looking for freelancers? Are you looking for consultancies that have an existing consultancy who you can train up and they, you know, they pay a license for the content in order to then be able to deliver? What's the pl what's the model that you're thinking yes, of? Yes, it's a very good question. And so as a as an entrepreneur, um, this is exactly the stage that we've got to in terms of having those conversations about how best to scale it and which is the best model to scale. So at the moment, what we're doing is uh, businesses, the sorts of people that I would shout out at are the three groups. If you are uh, a young graduate um, or a young person who's got lots of ambitions, uh, wants a great job in the future, um, you've um, been to university or not necessarily been to university, but you're sassy, you want to make things happen. You need this program because you need inspirational communication skills yes. to get your, your, your career um, on track. Yeah. So that's the first, that's the, from, from the, that's, that's a, a big group. So if you are in that category, get in touch with us. A young graduate, 20 something 30 something wanting to scale up your career ladder you have got to be able to communicate with confidence presence and impact yes. and uh, to get you at that uh, um the the second group are managers people who are aspiring managers or are in companies or in consultancies who are managers if that's your title role you are you are stressed out. Uh, you are in the frozen middle. You you get instructions from everywhere. Um, you sometimes need to deal with you know customers who have absolutely had it. But at the same time, you're having to deal with your bosses upstairs, and you're having to manage people uh, downwards. Um, and um, and you're probably not getting a lot of traction from HR either. <laughs> so um, so if that's you, absolutely. Um, and then there is the traditional leadership. If you are on an EXCO or a management board, this is your chance to completely rethink and re-experience what real communication skills does for leadership. Um, and, and I would encourage people to come on our programs. And then, of course, within organizations, there are the functions. I mean, one of the places that I want to or groups I want to really collaborate with is actually uh, HR. Yeah. Um, 
because and I've been very encouraged um, because, you know, we are not working uh, a sort of, you know, against we, we all want to be part of the solution. And I've been very encouraged by the conversations um, that I've been having with some HR. And I've actually recently been invited to write for a couple of HR um, publications, which is lovely because I'm bringing a different perspective, an additional, I suppose, communication relational relationship centered. So one of my big, big target markets is if you are um, in HR, you're an HR director, an HR manager, and you want that extra relationship focused um, uh, um a perspective um, and to get it in the muscle yourself, then this is the course for you. Because one of the things that I think HR needs to do, HR needs to reform in the best possible way. Because I think for a lot of employees, and they say this to me a lot, the H in the HR is losing its significance. And for many, it has lost its significance because HR has been forced by technology um, and their masters to default to technology. Yes. Everything's done on a platform. And, yeah. and I think HR could do with being role models and ambassadors for relationship-centered communication skills, get it in the muscle, and then make it happen in their own businesses. And so they would have those takeaways from us. And yeah. that's how we scale it. They would be they need to be the change agents, really, exactly. don't they? Exactly. Exactly. Because exactly. if they they would be the natural ones to take mm. it on. But of course, <laughs> as you said, it may already be programmed out of them because yeah. of the systems and procedures that now exist to make everything mm. automatic and algorithm centric. Um, and that's all they're focused on. But yeah, you need to, you know, retrain somebody or somebody who's fairly fresh who can be molded into your way of thinking and operating yeah yeah but i and, maybe... and I just I just want to add to you for HR, I think HR have been under a lot of pressure in the last mm. 10 to 15 years. It's been very difficult for the HR function because it's had to operate from, you know, a, a whole raft of days when it was actually called personnel, which yes. I'm sure you and I remember, yes. um, uh, to HR. And I think sometimes, you know, the transition and the clue is in the title, mm. <laughs> you know, um, well, resources. Lot of them... Yeah, a lot of them have changed it now to talent, haven't they, as well? So. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> but, but but to talent. Um, but I think one of the big things um, that, that there is a danger of and actually happens is that simply changing your name and having a flashy front yeah. uh, with very little substance to back it up isn't going to retain your staff. No. <laughs> You make a very good point, yeah. And that's and that's why it doesn't matter whether you're now chief talent officer, um, people people conglomerate or whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. just just you know just just you know, <laughs> twisting around the title isn't gonna make your stressed out manager who is still having to send try and get hold of you through a portal feel any better. No, no, I agree one hundred percent. So there, there is a there is a job to be done there, Mitty, and it's a massive task. And I admire your passion and your drive to get this done. Um, I think I, I think sometimes I some days I some 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 days I think, oh heavens, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm exo I wake up, and if anybody is listening um, and thinks, um, are there any are there any difficult days? Are there any challenging days? My answer is every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if if you are trying to build your business and have an idea and a vision, know that you are in good company. If you wake up and you think, "Oh heavens, what am I doing?" Yeah. But but if it burns bright in your soul, yes. keep going. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't give up. Keep Don't going. Give up. Yeah. I mean, over the last seven years, um, which is how I've been building this since I wrote my book, um, Putting the Soul Back into Business Communication, it, it's when I look back and then colleagues and friends say, goodness, have you produced all these brochures? Is that your website? Is that with these your clients? And I think, oh, well, maybe it's not so bad. Nice. <laughs> 
you know, but but there are days you're completely overwhelmed by it all. Do you know what I mean? Of course, yeah, totally understand. Tot and understandable because it's. I I think you you've got the tone about right. You know, I, I let you speak for a while to see how passionate you were about this to kind of get a sense of your your passion and the information that you have. And I do believe the message is spot on. And I don't think anybody can go and hide in the corner and go, no, this is not happening here because it's happening everywhere. Yes, yes. And and it's it's my passion for this. It's a life's work. It, it, that's what propels me. Of course. That's what propels me because I, I want to help make the difference. I want to help be part of the solution for us as individuals in business and in society to get this balance right between people, process and technology. We've got to find the right sweet spot. At the moment, it's dysfunctional. Yeah. Yeah. And and more and more people are losing the art of communication skills. I'm astonished. I was at a function the other day and somebody asked me what I did. And I said, well, I, 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 I sort of specialize in communication skills. And they went, oh, is that telecommunications? I went, no, 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 no. I, I, I sort of had to dip more carrots into the hummus. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I went, no. And they went, all oh, right. And then, then then they said, oh, I've got, I could connect you to somebody um, because they're in communication. I said, oh, well, that's nice. And um, and then and then she said to me, well, you know, they, they're a company who've produced this great communication tool. And wait for this, Michael. It's to um, help. It, it actually alerts you if you have an urgent email over the other emails. And then it sends it to the I started to glaze over. I, I mean, I was, I, I was starting to be very polite. I went, oh, right. That's not quite the communication I was thinking of. But, but you know, I, 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 I take the option. Oh, goodness oh. me. Losing the will to live. But, uh, you people know. have no idea. They've been sucked. You know, um, I don't know if you ever, uh, if you're a science fiction fan or not, but there was a great series called Star Trek. Oh, yes, I remember Star Trek. Do you Trek. remember? And do you remember yeah. the Borg? Oh, yes. Yes. And there's a saying in the Borg, which is resistance is futile. Yes. And that's where everybody is. They've all yes. been taken over by the Borg, you know. Yes. Yes, um, and yet, and yet, as a as a consequence of being taken over by the Borg, they're all completely stressed out and utterly unhappy. Yes, well, you that, would do. You would do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They exhaust everybody, and then people say to me, "Oh, you know, I'm just exhausted. I've got no time for myself. My brain's always switched on. We'll switch it off. Turn the <laughs> smartphone off. Yes, don't, don't have notifications. Nobody's forcing you. No." No. Do you know what I mean? Take a breather. Yeah. I've yeah. had I've had my notifications off my phone now for oh, over 12 months. I oh I I don't have them on. And and what difference has it made for you? It's been brilliant. Yeah. yeah it's absolutely. been brilliant. It's like, you know, ding ding woof woof, you know. <laughs> It's like there's no dings. My phone never dings anymore, apart from if people send a text message or they phone, just like a phone used to be. Mm -hmm. And there are no red circles to say you've got so many notifications to look at because mm -hmm. we've, we've all been programmed. Well, it's interesting. Two things. Um, well, when I got my my smartphone from my local high street, of course, the young yeah, the young man went, oh, and everything is sorted. And, and then he started pinging. And I went, well, how do you get that off? You know, now I know how to turn it off mm. myself. Mm. And he went, oh, are you sure? You won't know when your emails come. I went, turn it off. <laughs> Silence is golden. It is. Trust me. Totally. He looked astonished. He went, are you sure? I said, I am so sure. And then the other thing I would say is that um, um, there's last week there was a, a newspaper article about um, Julian Dunk Dunkerton, the founder of um, 
super dry, you know, this extraordinarily yes. successful company. Yes. Um, and I think there's a full feature of it in this month's Tatler or whatever. Mm. But he was in the Telegraph newspaper and um, worth 440 million, could have any technology he wanted in the world. And yet his biggest message for anybody who wants to be successful remotely is to ditch your emails and turn off your smartphone. And apparently he only has the most basic Nokia, mm. which just makes telephone calls and barely sends texts. He will only read an email if a member of staff deems it really important that he trusts and, and has it printed for him. And obviously he's got staff so he can afford to have that printed yes yes but that was his central message he says basically it helps to uh, refresh his mind and that's how he's been able to be so successful you need some time in your mind yeah yeah you know Mitty, we we could speak for hours on this topic absolutely and 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 i love it now where can people find out more about this and the programs that you run and the information please absolutely i'll include it in the notes but say it verbally in case people are distracted <laughs> of course if you want to find out any information about our courses and and go to our website which is www miticom m i t i c o m Dot co dot uk if you want to drop me a line you can go to info at miticom.co.uk. Um, you can have a look at some of our programs online, but we bespoke programs um, and we can at the moment for groups, et cetera, et cetera. So give me a ring. Uh, tell me what your needs are. Let's have a chat. Bob's your uncle. Sally's your aunt. <laughs> Sally. It's your aunt. I like that. I've not, that's a new one for me. Yeah, that, that's that's the full that's the full version. No, I've never. Aunt. Well, I've been in this country long enough now. I should know that one, but I haven't <laughs> heard it. <laughs> oh, it's just that my um, I, I, my my builder who's worked with me for twenty years has comes to the rescue, damsel in distress. Whenever I have issues with my house, it's a good old fashioned Cockney builder, and um, you know he's got all those phrases. Me, everything's all right. Pops your uncle, Sally's your aunt. <laughs> love him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And people can find you on kind of LinkedIn and Twitter. Absolutely. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Um, and I started to build up some pictures on Instagram as well. Wow. And you know, you know something? I came off Instagram mm. and I came off WhatsApp. Mm. Um, I'm active only on Facebook in some groups because of some um, leisure things that I'm doing in, in groups. Um, but apart from that, I don't post to Facebook anymore. So, um, yeah. I've and I, I can say that I wish I didn't have to post, but off, what I found doing this in the last seven years is that as a communication specialist, people thought I didn't really exist if I didn't post some of my work. I <laughs> so I found myself in a conundrum. Mm. And therefore, the, the, out of the four I use, I I do LinkedIn very well. Facebook yes. is a mixture of personal and business. Yes. And then obviously, I tweet every now and again. But anybody can join me and follow me. And I'd be very grateful um, and um, always happy to have a chat. Exactly. Let's pick up the phone and have a conversation. That's Yes, it. ring me so I can hear your voice. And just finally, for anybody out there listening who is at work or in a position to make this happen, if you want, you can take the Miticom Friday Challenge. Should I tell you about the Miticom yeah, please, Friday please, Challenge? please, yeah. Very quickly, the Miticom <laughs> Friday Challenge is that you go into work on a Friday um, work it all out in your office, um, and you go email cold turkey. No emails. Wow. On a Friday. <laughs> if if you really can't do it and you're twitching already at the thought of it, then come to an agreement to only pick 10 emails for that day or better five. Mm. And you do it, um, you've got your emails within one hour slot, and that's it. But the best one 
is the Miticom Friday Challenge in full, which is on a Friday. The only way you communicate is to go get up, speak to a human being. If you can't do that, pick up the phone and speak to a human being. And if they are abroad, because you're in a global, then get a video conferencing tool so that you can see them and speak to them as yeah, a human being. Yeah. That's that's the Friday challenge. No online messaging tools like emails. Out. And do you have Apart from hashtag Friday challenge, do you have a different hashtag for that? No, but it's, it's interesting because I only came up with this one a few months ago, which has okay. really taken people love it. But I ought to have a hash. You can tell that I'm not born for technology, can't no, you? But I think it's a brilliant one to start a hashtag on Twitter <laughs> and everywhere else, of course. Right. Yes. You can call it the hash hashtag Mitty Friday challenge. It's a bit long, yeah. but... It's yeah, Miticom Friday Challenge. Yes, I'll, I'll, we, we can do that. Well, without, without, just Mitty, just Mitty. Ah, uh, Mitty Friday Challenge, yeah. yes. Oh, thank you for that. M hashtag Mitty Friday Challenge. I think that would be... That would work. That okay, would work, brilliant. definitely would work. I'll tweet yeah. about it. Will you? Yeah, of brilliant. course, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and I, I, when I first gave that exercise, um, you know, because people were, I mean, they looked completely agog at the thought of not doing it. And they went, oh, we've never done. And then they thought, oh, what a good idea. And yes. then and then they started arguing about, well, you should we, we should do it completely cold turkey. We should do it five. No, no, forget five. Cold turkey. You know, it was <laughs> <great fun. laughs> Oh, yeah, we could have some fun with that on Twitter. Definitely. <laughs> great. Well, let, yes, absolutely. Let's talk about it um, um, further. But that's a great idea to build on it. But I love my Friday challenge. Yeah, you know? it sounds yeah. a really great idea. And oh. I know you are full of great ideas, Mitty. I can tell. That's. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on today thank and chatting with me. It's been absolutely fascinating. Loved hearing your story and where you've where you've come from and all the travels and everything. Absolutely fascinating. And it's so puts everything into context in terms of what you're doing today. It just is so natural and you were just born to do this, most definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And, and hopefully we will meet in person one day very soon in London. When I'm next in London, I'll let you know if you're there. We could grab a bite to eat or something and, and have a further detailed chat face to face. Top plan. <laughs> Looking forward to it already. <laughs> OK, Mitty, take care. And you too. Bye bye. Bye for now. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.